Good morning, family. Have you ever come across people that are objectively wrong about something? And not, not just a people, but a whole group of people that have come to the wrong opinion about something? Um, Thanksgiving's coming up. Be uh, Thursday, right? Did I get that right? Okay. I, had to, I have to double check. I don't... <laughs> I've, I've frequently talked about um, my heart doesn't put a lot of emphasis on holidays. Uh, Thanksgiving is kind of an exception because I really like turkey. I've met a lot of people that insist that turkey is subpar and they go with him. You're wrong. Any of you who say that turkey is not the greatest is just wrong. <laughs> Thanksgiving is one of those times, it's, it's, it's quite a, a wonderful thing, honestly, because it's not a religious holiday. And yet, it's the one that people seem to not struggle with keeping it about the main, main idea. Everybody remembers that Thanksgiving is about remembering to be thankful. And families have their own ritual or... or, or uh, Tradition around being thankful, whether you go around the, the table before you eat and tell what you're thankful for. Or um, there's some families that have special prayers that they pray each Thanksgiving to give thanks for all the things that they've been blessed with that year. Or um, all kinds of families with all kinds of traditions. It's, it's strange to me that nobody seems to struggle remembering that Thanksgiving is about being thankful. We often will forget what Easter is really about. We'll forget what Christmas is really about sometimes, getting wrapped up in the, in the holiday itself. But Thanksgiving is always about being thankful. And it's the one holiday that doesn't have its foundation in religion at all. It's also strange to me how simple of a command that is to be thankful. And it is a command. We'll go through several of those scriptures here today. How difficult it can be to have a mindset of thanksgiving. I always relate things to, um, to how we see it in other people, especially children. That's, that's such an easy example to give. When we talk about what God expects from us and how we expect those things from our children, but then we don't give that back to God. Like I, I, I give things to my daughter. I expect her to be grateful for that. Right. There's nothing worse than a kid when you give them something and they complain about it or, or they talk about what they don't have. <clears throat> how often does our communication with God look like that, though? I mean, God has given and given and given to the point where he's given his very self. And so often our focus is on the things that we don't have. It's not to say it's not uh, it's not to say that it's bad to recognize the things that we're lacking and to go to God for them. But it can't come at the cost of forgetting what's already been given. We run the risk of sounding like ungrateful children. First Thessalonians chapter five, uh, verse 16 says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Uh, you think about what that says, and I didn't even put my mic in this morning. You think about what that says in all circumstances. This is not this is not a verse that's talking about being thankful for what God has given you, even if it's not necessarily what you wanted him to give you. This is a verse reminding us that no matter how bad life circumstances get, no matter how unfavorable it can be sometimes, that we're supposed to find a way to be thankful for them. For some people, this is easy. For other people, less so. But... It can be really tough sometimes. How 
how do we stay thankful when we're going hungry? How do we stay thankful when we're worried about whether or not we're going to be able to pay our bills? How do we stay thankful when our health is failing us? How do we stay thankful when uh, we are angry with the people around us and we don't know how to um, reconcile relationships? There are so many people here this morning with um, problems within their family unit. Whether that be your grown children not getting along with each other or with you or whether it's your grandkids or um, extended family. There's so many people here with issues within their family. How do you stay thankful when you get together for Thanksgiving, but you're at such odds with somebody that they won't attend? It can certainly be tough to see those empty seats and give thanks for the ones that are filled. But understand that this isn't this isn't some small thing. This isn't just a characteristic that God wishes we had. We're told in, in Thessalonians that this is his will for us, that we are thankful. That we remember always what God has given. I've often said and will continue to say that the why is sometimes just as important as the what. It's not just good to know what God tells us or what God commands for us or what God wants from us. It's also good to know why. When you think about the... the um, Results of a thankful heart, right? Not not just the fact that it's much more pleasant to be around you when you're grateful, but how hard how how hard is it to continue focusing on the lack? How hard is it to continue focusing on the negative when you are constantly re uh, redirecting yourself to being thankful for what's been given to you? It is difficult to be envious of people's lives when your sole focus is giving thanks for the life of Christ. It is difficult to grieve the temptation that you're forced to overcome that surely no one else deals with. When you're spending so much time being thankful for the freedom that God has blessed you with. It is difficult to continue being angry because things aren't working out the way you want them to or people said things you don't like or what have you when you're thankful that you've been given a family. Being grateful shifts our focus. It helps us see beyond our struggles and recognize that God is good. God is good even when life isn't, and especially when life isn't. It is something that can shift our minds away from the things that make life more difficult. And man, how much easier is it to move past problems or to solve them when they aren't consuming us? You think about that? There's a real life reason for why we need to be shifting our focus away from what we lack. There are problems. The temptations that we have, the struggles that life brings, the things that we lack, they're struggles. And, and it's human nature that we seek solutions to those problems. But think about this. How much easier is it to solve a problem when you're no longer emotionally invested in it? When your heart doesn't start to control how you view it. I think back to taking college algebra and uh, probably one of my least favorite college classes, oddly enough. And I really hated the fact that I had to take it. <laughs> there, there was uh, our math teacher at the time is a very well educated mathematician, um, had a doctorate in math, which to me, just sounds like a colossal waste of energy, <laughs> if I'm being honest, but he's good. 
He was phenomenally good at math. Not only was he good at it, and understand that this isn't me just lavishing praise. I didn't even get along with the guy. But I will say that I have met few people that can teach something so well. I watched him take students that realistically had no business being in college and get them to the point where they were at 100% by the end of his class because he was that good at teaching it. But I always remembered getting into these problems that he would pose to the class that seemed impossible to solve. And he always gave extra credit. He would put these problems up on the board and any student that could work that problem out and bring him the solution would get extra credit for his class. And in a class like algebra, you kind of need that extra credit sometimes. And I, I remember watching so many students struggle with those problems and they would fight and fight and fight through it. And they would they would get upset about it because they wanted that extra credit. They were emotionally invested in solving this simple math problem. And then you had the students who didn't care. The students who didn't care because as hard as that problem was, they had such a good grade that it wasn't gonna make a difference, right? I was there by the end of the year. At the beginning of the year, I needed some help. <laughs> Cause unlike a lot of students, it'd been like 10 years since I'd taken a math class. But I remember watching these students just fly through this. Half of them, by the end of the day, would have that problem solved, the problem that took the rest of us a whole week. And you ask them about it, it's not because they're better at math, it's because they really didn't care if it got solved or not. They didn't have an emotional investment in solving it. This seems like a very mundane example, but I, I'm just pointing it out because there is a lot of times when problems are in front of us. And when we're completely invested in the problem, the solutions can be really hard to see. Spiritual problems operate the same way. The easiest way to solve a spiritual dilemma is to not allow yourself to be spiritually invested in it anymore, to step back from it. Refocusing ourselves to giving thanks for what God has given us allows us to distance ourselves emotionally from the spiritual problems at hand. Philippians chapter 4 Verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I want you to think about this because... What it actually says is to petition God while being thankful. That seems paradoxical, doesn't it? So those of you that don't know that word, it just means it seems contradictory. To, to sit here and go to God with the things I don't have, with the things I need, with the struggles I have, being thankful anyways, that, that seems to not really go together. But we're told to pray, believing that the answer to the prayer has already been given. That's another thing that's really hard for us to do sometimes, to pray to God and say, God, I, I need this from you. And to end that prayer, believing wholeheartedly that what you've prayed for, God has already supplied. But I think that this is the key to being able to petition God with a thankful heart because we're already going into it believing that God has given it to us. And man, when you're laying out your deepest, biggest needs and believing that it's already been answered, it's so much easier to be thankful to him while you're praying for it. My daughter sees me as uh, somebody who's pretty close to infallible at this point. She brings me toys that, she's, that are completely done for, believing wholeheartedly that I can fix it. 
Not only can I fix it, I don't need to be in any special place to fix it. I don't need tools. She can just bring me a toy whenever it breaks, and no matter what's going on, I should just be able to fix it. I've worked really hard to not have to yet admit to her that that's not how that works. I bring this up because she's already ready to say thank you to me before I've even fixed what she's broken. Because she's came to me just believing it's already done. It's already taken care of. There is no possibility dad says I can't do this. Of course, when I do say I can't do this, it just means way more heartbreak than it should be bringing to the table. I think sometimes it gets in our way when we pray to God and believe that he's not going to give what we ask for, or we pray to God believing that he can't do something, God forbid, it gets in our way of being thankful to God. And we do it. We pray that way more often than many of us would like to admit. And we use things to cover up our doubt. Lines like, if it be your will, it's a great line, it's a good sentiment, but we're actually many times using that to cover up our doubt that God will bless us when we ask him to. Say, God, please help me with my health. Please help me become better. If it be your will, God. Well, you're not actually praying for God's will. That's your way of covering up the fact that you don't believe he's actually going to bring you good health. It's a way for you to insulate yourself against the disappointment. Now, much like those toys my child brings me, the answer is not always going to be for me to immediately fix it. Sometimes I can fix it, but it's got to wait because I don't have super glue on me at the time. Sometimes the answer is you've broken this beyond repair. There is no fixing this. You're going to have to move on without it. But we have to be a people that are so confident that God is going to give us what we need that we don't need to insulate ourselves from disappointment. That we can legitimately just be okay with whatever that response is. And has he not already given us everything we need? Has he not already fulfilled that promise? He has given us everything we need that pertains to eternal life. What more could you ask for? What could you possibly be disappointed by? You ask him to extend your life. He's promised you eternal life. There is no more extension to ask for. Your life is never going to end. It transitions, it looks different, but the life is going to be there. And in, 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 from that perspective, man, how easy is it to be thankful for your life, regardless of the circumstances around it? Gratitude has this ability to bring us joy and peace in a way that few things can. When we focus on what we have instead of what we lack, we open our hearts to experiencing God's blessings. You hear that? When we close ourselves off to being thankful for what's being given, we stop having the ability to see the gifts of God. We blind ourselves to them. It's not just about saying thank you. It's about recognizing the small minutia, the everyday moments where God has revealed his love to us. It's not just saying thank you in the moment. It's living a life that reflects a belief that I have been blessed beyond measure. Whether that's being gentle with somebody who the world would not consider deserving of gentleness whether that's concerning myself with something that realistically, if it continued, doesn't affect me. 
You see, I, I can invest energy into helping people understand what they're doing wrong or why that's wrong. I can, I can do these things because at the end of the day, I'm removed emotionally from the problem. Whether you choose to correct the sin in your life is between you and God. And I'm happy to tell you about it. I'm happy to offer advice on how to resolve that issue. But at the end of the day, if you choose not to, my relationship with God is still secure. But if God has loved me enough to intercede for me, to interrupt my life of wickedness, if he has loved me enough to transform me, to bring me life anew, will businesses uh, of mine to not offer the same to those around me? If God is in his infinite mercy and patience, bears with me through all of my childlike struggles, all the times that I fall short while recognizing that I'm falling short, my rebellions against him, in spite of the fact that I know in the moment that I am rebelling against him, if God can be patient and merciful towards me in those moments, will businesses of mine to be unforgiving towards others? Being thankful means living your life in such a way that people can see your acknowledgement of what you've been given. It's not just something you say in prayer. Many of my prayers start with a repetition, and most of us have those, right? We have these things that we say in every single prayer. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Almost every one of my prayers starts with, thank you, God, for this day that you've given. And if I'm not careful, that can be an empty gesture. But it had a purpose when I first started making sure that I said it. It served to remind me that no matter how good the day felt, no matter what problems came with that day, the day itself was given to me. And it's a greater blessing than I could have ever given to myself. Certainly no man is capable of giving me such a thing. Our prayers should be focused on thankfulness, but our lives have to reflect that it's true. The next thing I want to point out is that thankfulness is, an act, is in and of itself an act of worship. We don't often think of it that way. But consider Psalms 100. Chapter 4 of Psalm 100 reads, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. How many times do, do we point out that when we start a prayer, it's not just join me in prayer. It's let's approach the throne of God. Where we get to kneel before God himself in spirit to communicate with him. Those prayers should be addressed from a point of thanksgiving. In being thankful, we are actually actively participating in worshiping God and acknowledging his greatness and his goodness and his faithfulness. It's not just about listing off the blessings that he gives to us. It's about recognizing who the giver of the blessings is. It's not just about what he's done. It's about who he is. And when you recognize that God is a God of mercy, that God is a God of grace, that God is a God of justice, well, then I can be thankful even when I don't feel blessed. 
I can be thankful because there are so many people who serve a master that is not those things. There are people who serve their bank accounts. But money is unfeeling. It's uncaring about your circumstances in life. It's uncaring about the state of your heart. It doesn't care about the things you care about. There are those unwittingly, unwittingly serving their master, Satan. But again, he's not, he's not a master that cares about your well-being. He's not a master who cares about blessing you with good things. He will, but only to continue having you serve him. We serve a God knowing who knows that there are times we're going to be pretty upset with him. There are going to be times when we really struggle with the way he allows our lives to go. And we wish he would give us the things that we want or the things that we believe we need. There we serve a God who is okay allowing us to get angry with him for the sake of giving us what he knows is best. And that's something to be thankful for. Like a parent that says, no, you can't have candy at eight o'clock at night. It's not about what we want. It's not about the things that make us happy in the moment. But instead, serving somebody with authority who will always look out for our greatest needs. And when we recognize that that's who we serve, it's easy to be okay with no. It's easy to be okay when we're not given the things that we think we should be given. It's about recognizing that God, you are the source of every good and perfect gift in my life. Thanksgiving must be a way of life. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 says, Paul, this is Paul talking. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We've made mention of the struggles that we have in our families. And isn't it awesome that we serve a God who's so concerned with peace. He's so concerned with the well-being of, uh, of his bride, of our family unit, that a huge, huge percentage of his scripture is designed to teach us how to be at peace with one another. We don't ever have to be in a position where I have to be okay with the life you've chosen to live. I have to be okay with disagreeing on what's important. I don't have to really deal with you bringing all of your personal problems to the table. Because when we gather at the table, it's never about us. When we gather to break bread together, it's always about Jesus. And our personal problems end up being secondary. Thanksgiving still has the same issues that most holidays have for me. But sometimes we allow it to be an excuse to relegate something we should be doing every day to one day a year. But let that be for the secular world. Let them continue believing that on this day, on Thursday, we need to especially be thankful. For us, we need to be a people that use it as a reminder of how we're supposed to be every day. That we use it as a day of repentance. 
where we think of all the times where we've forgotten to be thankful and recommit ourselves to a better way of life. Colossians tells us a lot about singing to each other, and so often we attribute songs only to being <coughs> pardon me, to only being worship of God. But I think that the reason Colossians tells us to sing to one another, it is really, really hard to be angry or hateful to somebody you're singing to. All right? I'm not somebody that does that. I don't serenade, right? I don't do that. My wife does. All right, she'll stand in the living room and sing karaoke or she sings along with the radio in the car. It is really hard to be having a fight with my wife while she's singing to me. Doesn't even matter what the song is. It could be Christmas music, which I despise listening to. And it is really hard not to just be okay with whatever we're dealing with. There's a reason that we're told to do that for one another. When we gather and sing together, it's not just about you and God. It's about us being together and being at peace with one another. And what more could you ask for? What more could you ask for than to have 20, 30, 50 people that you are unified with? That you're in sync with, with the same intention, with the same purpose. The world knows little other than hopelessness and despair. It comes from living a life apart from grace. A life where every mistake you have has eternal consequences you'll never be separated from. A life where every mistake carries a burden that you can never rid yourself of. Surely that in and of itself is something to be thankful for. That that's not the life we live. That that's not the life God has designed for us. That we serve a God who's so concerned with us that he would do anything to save us from that fate. to give his own son, to give his own life so that we can be assured that the debt's been paid, that the guilt's been washed away. A God who's so concerned with our well-being and with our eternal joy that he would take the guilt himself. Think back to all the things I've done in my life and surely the things I deserve because of them. And I have found a God in heaven, a God willing to take all of those consequences from me. If you're struggling today to live a life of, of thanksgiving, I encourage you to be thankful, if nothing else, than just for that. That there is at the right hand of, of the Father someone who intercedes for us, who knows our struggles and our temptations and our failings and does not hate us for them. This morning we make offer for any of you, the, of the, for any of you who might be in need, whether it's reconciliation to God and his bride whether it's prayers from your fellow saints, whatever your needs are this morning, we ask that you bring them forward and make them known so we can help you see the map as we stand and sing. I heard no
Before your throne, we just humble our hearts before you. And when we do have a heart of thanksgiving, oftentimes we think of the material things that you've given us, but the spiritual blessings, Father, that you've given us. We just song about the blood that cleanses us of our sins, the fact that we have eternal life with you, um, and we can have a peace from that. We can we have a hope through that. And Father, this week, oftentimes we think of the bounty that we have and, and all the food that is surrounded us, turkey and pies, and uh, it's always about the bounty, and we are thankful for that. But I know, Father, that there will be those who will be alone, eating off paper plates, and having just meager scraps to eat. I pray, Father, that no matter whatever our circumstance is, that we can be thankful to you and, and always have a peace because of what you've done for us. Help us to have the attitude of Jesus and of Paul, and no matter where they were at, they always had an attitude of thanksgiving. Help us to leave with that mindset today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.